chapter 18 part 6 of volume 2 of a popular history of France from the earliest times this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org recording by Sudeshna volume 2 of a popular history of France from the earliest times by Francois Guizot Translated by Robert Black Chapter 18 The Kingship in France Part 6 He had in 1216 another great chance of showing his discretion. The English barons were at war with their king John Lackland in defense of Magna Charta, which they had obtained the year before, and they offered the crown of England to the king of France for his son Prince Louis. Before accepting, Philip demanded 24 hostages, taken from the men of note in the country, as a guarantee that the offer would be supported in good earnest and the hostages were sent to him. But Pope Innocent III had lately released King John from his oath in respect of Magna Charta, and had excommunicated the insurgent barons, and he now instructed his legate to oppose the projected design, with the threat of excommunicating the King of France. Philip Augustus, who in his youth had dreamed of resuscitating the empire of Charlemagne, was strongly tempted to seize the opportunity of doing over again the work of William the Conqueror, but he hesitated to endanger his power and his kingdom in such a war against King John and the Pope. The prince was urgent in entreating his father. Sir, said he, I am your liege man for the fife you have given me on this side of the sea but it pertains not to you to decide aught as to the kingdom of England. I do beseech you to place no obstacle in the way of my departure. The king, seeing his son's firm resolution and anxiety, says the historian Matthew Paris, was one with him in feeling and desire. But foreseeing the dangers of events to come, he did not give his public consent, and without any expression of wish or counsel, permitted him to go with the gift of his blessing. It was the young and ambitious Princess Blanche of Castille, wife of Prince Louis and destined to be the mother of Saint Louis, who, after her husband's departure for England, made it her business to raise troops for him and to send him means of sustaining the war. Events justified the discreet reserve of Philip Augustus, for John Lackland, after having suffered one reverse previously, died on the 19th of October 1216. His death broke up the party of the insurgent barons and his son, Henry III, who was crowned on the 28th of October in Gloucester Cathedral, immediately confirmed the Great Charter. Thus, the national grievance vanished, and national feeling resumed its sway in England. The French everywhere became unpopular, and after a few months' struggle, with equal want of skill and success, Prince Louis gave up his enterprise and returned to France with his French comrades on no other conditions but a mutual exchange of prisoners and an amnesty for the English who had been his adherents. At this juncture, as well as in the crusade against the Albigensians, Philip Augustus behaved towards the Pope with a wisdom and ability, hard of attainment at any time, and very rare in his own. He constantly humoured the papacy without being subservient to it, and he testified towards it his respect and at the same time his independence. He understood all the gravity of a rupture with Rome, and he neglected nothing to avoid one, but he also considered that Rome, herself not wanting in discretion, would be content with the deference of the King of France, rather than get embroiled with him by exacting his submission. Philip Augustus in his political life always preserved to this proper mean, and he found it succeed, but in his domestic life there came a day when he suffered himself to be hurried out of his usual deference towards the Pope, and after a violent attempt at resistance, he resigned himself to submission. Three years after the death of his first wife, Isabel of Haneu, who had left him a son, Prince Louis, he married Princess Ingeburga of Denmark, without knowing anything at all of her, just as it generally happens in the case of royal marriages. No sooner had she become his wife than, without any cause that can be assigned with certainty, 
he took such a dislike to her that towards the end of the same year he demanded off and succeeded in obtaining from a french council held at compiegne nullity of his marriage on the ground of prohibited consanguinity o oh, naughty france naughty france o oh, rome rome cried the poor danish princess on learning this decision and she did in fact appeal to pope celestine the third whilst the question was being investigated at rome ingeburga whom philip had in vain tried to send back to denmark was marched about under restraint in france from castle to castle and convent to convent and treated with iniquitous and shocking severity pope celestine after examination annulled the decision of the council of compiegne touching the pretended consanguinity leaving in suspense the question of divorce and consequently without breaking the tie of marriage between the king and the danish princess i have seen he wrote to the archbishop of sens the genealogy sent to me by the bishops and it is due to that inspection and the uproar caused by this scandal that i have annulled the decree take care now therefore that philip do not marry again and so break the tie which still unites him to the church philip paid no heed to this canonical injunction his heart was set upon marrying again and after having unsuccessfully sought the band of two german princesses on the borders of the rhine who were alarmed by the fate of ingeburga he obtained that of a princess a tyrolese by origin agnes according to others mary of merania that is moravia an austrian province in german moren out of which the chroniclers of the time made merani or merania the name that has remained in the history of agnes she was the daughter of berthold marquis of istria whom about 1180 the emperor frederick barbarossa had made duke of moravia according to all contemporary chronicles agnes was not only beautiful but charming she made a great impression at the court of france and philip augustus after his marriage with her in june 1196 became infatuated with her but a pope more stern and bold than celestine the third innocent the third had just been raised to the holy see and was exerting himself in court as well as monastery to effect a reformation of morals immediately after his accession he concerned himself with the conjugal irregularity in which the king of france was living my predecessor celestine he wrote to the bishop of paris would fain have put a stop to this scandal but he was unsuccessful as for me i am quite resolved to prosecute his work and obtain by all and any means fulfillment of god's law be instant in speaking thereof to the king on my behalf and tell him that his obstinate refusals may probably bring upon him both the wrath of god and the thunders of the church and indeed philip's refusals were very obstinate for the pride of the king and the feelings of the man were equally wounded I had rather lose half my domains said he than separate from Agnes. The pope threatened him with the interdict that is the suspension of all religious ceremonies festivals and forms in the church of France. Philip resisted not only the threat but also the sentence of the interdict which was actually pronounced first in the churches of the royal domain and afterwards in those of the whole kingdom. So wroth was the king says the chronicle of St Denis that he thrust from their sees all the prelates of his kingdom because they had assented to the interdict I had rather turn musliman said philip saladin was a happy man for he had no pope but innocent the 3rd was inflexible he claimed respect for laws divine and human for the domestic hearth and public order the conscience of the nation was troubled agnes herself applied to the pope urging her youth her ignorance of the world the sincerity and purity of her love for her husband innocent the 3rd was touched and before long gave indisputable evidence that he was but without budging from his duty and his right as a christian for 4 years the struggle went on at last philip yielded to the injunction of the pope and the feeling of his people he sent away agnes and recalled ingeburga The Pope, in his hour of victory, showed his sense of equity and his moral appreciation, taking into consideration the good faith of Agnes in respect of her marriage, and Philip's possible mistake as to his right to marry her. He declared the legitimacy of the two children born of their union. 
Agnes retired to Poissy, where a few months afterwards she died. Ingeburga resumed her title and rights as queen, but without really enjoying them. Philip, incensed as well as beaten, banished her far from him and his court to Etamp, where she lived eleven years in profound retirement. It was only in 1212 that to fully satisfy the Pope, Philip, more preserving in his political wisdom than his domestic prejudices, restored the Danish princess to all her royal station at his side. She was destined to survive him. There can be little doubt but that the affection of Philip Augustus for Agnes of Merania was sincere. Nothing can be better proof of it than the long struggle he maintained to prevent separation from her. But to say nothing of the religious scruples which at last perhaps began to prick the conscience of the king, great political activity and the government of a kingdom are a powerful cure for sorrows of the heart. And seldom is there a human soul so large and so constant as to have room for sentiments and interests so different, both of them at once and for a long continuance. It has been shown with what intelligent assiduity Philip Augustus strove to extend, or rather to complete the kingdom of France. What a mixture of firmness and moderation he brought to bear upon his relations with his vassals, as well as with his neighbors, and what bravery he showed in war though he preferred to succeed by the weapons of peace. He was as energetic and effective in the internal administration of his kingdom as in foreign affairs. Monsieur Leopold de Lille, one of the most learned French academicians and one of the most accurate in his knowledge, has devoted a volume of more than 700 pages octavo to a simple catalogue of the official acts of Philip Augustus. And this catalogue, contains a list of 2,236 administrative acts of all kinds, of which M. Delisle confines himself to merely setting forth the title and object. Search has been made in this long table to see what part was taken by Philip Augustus in the establishment and interior regulation of the communes, that great fact which is so conspicuous in the history of French civilization, and which will before long be made the topic of discourse here. The search brings to light during this reign 41 acts confirming certain communes already established or certain privileges previously granted to certain populations, 43 acts establishing new communes or granting new local privileges, and 9 acts decreeing suppression of certain communes or a repressive intervention of the royal authority in their internal regulation on account of quarrels or irregularities in their relations either with their lord or especially with their bishop. These mere figures show the liberal character of the government of Philip Augustus in respect of this important work of the 11th, 12th and 13th centuries. Nor are we less struck by his efficient energy in his care for the interests and material civilization of his people. In 1185, as he was walking one day in his palace, he placed himself at a window whence he was sometimes pleased by way of pastime to watch the Seine flowing by. Some carts as they passed caused the mud with which the streets were filled to emit a fetid smell quite unbearable. The king, shocked at what was as unhealthy as it was disgusting, sent for the burghers and provost of the city, and ordered that all the thoroughfares and streets of Paris should be paved with hard and solid stone. For this right Christian prince aspired to rid Paris of her ancient name, Lutetia, Mud Town. It is added that, on hearing of so good a resolution, a moneyed man of the day named Gerard de Poissy volunteered to contribute towards the construction of the pavement 11,000 silver marks. Nor was Philip Augustus less concerned for the external security than for the internal salubrity of Paris. In 1190, on the eve of his departure for the crusade, he ordered the burghers of Paris to surround with a good wall, flanked by towers, the city he loved so well, and to make gates thereto, and in twenty years this great work was finished on both sides of the Seine. The king gave the same orders, adds the historian Rigor, about the towns and castles of all his kingdom, and indeed it appears from the catalogue of Monsieur Leopold de Lille at the date of 1193, that at the request of Philip Augustus, Peter de Courtenay, Count of Nevers, 
with the aid of the churchmen, had the walls of the town of Auxerre built, and Philip's foresight went beyond such important achievements. He had a good wall built to enclose the wood of Vincennes, heretofore open to any sort of folk. The king of England, on hearing thereof, gathered a great mass of fawns, hinds, does, and bucks, taken in his forests in Normandy and Aquitaine, and having had them shipped aboard a large covered vessel with suitable fodder, he sent them by way of the Seine to King Philip Augustus, his liege lord at Paris. King Philip received this gift gladly, had his parks stocked with the animals and put keepers over them. A feeling totally unconnected with the pleasures of the chase caused him to order an enclosure very different from that of Vincennes. The common cemetery of Paris, hard by the Church of the Holy Innocents, opposite the street of St. Denis, had remained up to that time open to all passers, man and beast, without anything to prevent it from being confounded with the most profane spot. And the king, hurt at such indecency, had it enclosed by high stone walls, with as many gates as were judged necessary, which were closed every night. At the same time, he had built in the same quarter the first great municipal marketplaces, enclosed likewise by a wall with gates shut at night, and surmounted by a sort of covered gallery. He was not quite a stranger to a certain instinct, neither systematic nor of general application, but practical and effective on occasion in favor of the freedom of industry and commerce. Before his time, the ovens employed by the baking trade in Paris were a monopoly for the profit of certain religious or laic establishments. But when Philip Augustus ordered the walling in of the new and much larger area of the city, he did not think it right to render its new inhabitants subject to these old liabilities. And he permitted all the bakers to have ovens wherein to bake their bread, either for themselves or for all individuals who might wish to make use of them. Nor were churches and hospitals a whit less than the material interests of the people an object of solicitude to him. His reign saw the completion, and it might almost be said, the construction of Notre Dame de Paris, the frontage of which in particular was the work of this epoch. At the same time the king had the palace of the Louvre repaired and enlarged, and he added to it that strong tower in which he kept in captivity for more than twelve years, Ferron, Count of Flanders, taken prisoner at the Battle of Bouvines. It would be a failure of justice and truth not to add to these proofs of manifold and indefatigable activity on the part of Philip Augustus the constant interest he testified in letters, science, study, the University of Paris and its masters and pupils. It was to him that in 1200, after a violent riot in which they considered they had reason to complain of the provost of Paris, the students owed a decree which, by regarding them as clerics, exempted them from the ordinary criminal jurisdiction, so as to render them subject only to ecclesiastical authority. At that time there was no idea how to efficiently protect freedom, save by granting some privilege. End of chapter 18, part 6 Recording by Sudeshna